Hey everybody, welcome to Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. We've got a great show for you tonight, this um, pre-Christmas Eve Eve show. So, you know the drill. Let me know where you're tuning in from in the world. Say hello, chime in, drop a thumbs up if you are appreciative of these informational videos. And if you're not, of course, make sure you subscribe. And tonight we're going to be talking about anemia. Now, a lot of you have heard about anemia it's a very, very common word used kind of in medical circles. Um, what's less common or what's less known, you know, when doctors talk about anemia, generally they're referring to iron deficiency. And, um, but unfortunately, this is not the only reason as to why we might see an anemia develop. And that's what I want to dive into a little bit deeper because many of you have been told you have anemia. Um, and some of you have, have been told you are iron deficient and some of you have been told you have anemia, but they don't know why the doctors don't understand why maybe it's a, just a number of different varieties of forms of anemia. So I'm going to throw a slide up here on the screen for you where you can check out all of the different types of nutritional anemia. So aside from iron, what are some of the other types of anemias that people might develop? So when we talk about iron deficiency, there's also copper deficiency anemia there's protein deficiency anemia and then there's a number of b vitamins but b12 and folate and uh, b5 and 6 and b2 uh, deficiency anemias can all occur uh, we also have uh, aside from that we have a number of, of other nutritional anemias predominantly even omega-3 deficiency uh, omega-3 fatty acid deficiency can also contribute to anemia. And then there's another variety of anemias that are caused as a result of antioxidant deficit, predominantly vitamin C and vitamin E deficiency anemias. So if you've ever felt super, super tired, right? We look at symptoms and symptom associations. Fatigue, even though you've slept adequate hours. So this is one of those, those hallmark symptoms of anemia. Let's say you've slept 10 hours and you wake up and you're still completely exhausted. This is a, a sign you might be anemic. So fatigue, and I'm not just talking about general, I'm tired today, although that can happen too. I'm talking about the person who's had adequate rest. There's no other observable or known reason why they might be tired. That fatigue is, is, is kind of relentless, okay? Shortness of breath. If you ever find yourself taking the staircase and running out of breath um, and you're not deconditioned, um, or if you find yourself just sitting there, sitting still, getting short of breath, or if you find yourself just taking a few steps and just minor exertion creates a shortness of breath, you might be anemic. Uh, anemic. Other symptoms, some common ones include brain fog. Brain fog is very, very common, and this is because lack of oxygen to the brain can trigger an inability to think clearly or a memory problem. Memory loss is part of that brain fog, fog scenario. And then we also have muscle issues. Um, your muscles demand oxygen to drive energy production, and so pain in the muscles, knots, chronic knots in the muscles, spasm in the muscle, um, all can happen. Exercise intolerance is another common symptom linked to anemia. So if you're suffering or struggling with these types of symptoms, if this is a common kind of wheelhouse of what your day might look like, slept plenty, wake up tired, short of breath, brain fog, can't exercise because it hurts, muscle pains and spasms, you find it difficult even with minor exertion, like these are all hallmark symptoms of anemia. Now these also match, guess what this matches? So this is where you kind of have to, low thyroid can also create these same exact symptoms. So sometimes what I see in my clinic is I see people come in, they've got a diagnosis of low thyroid, they've been being medicated, Medicine's not working for them, right? So maybe they've been on the medication a number of months. They're still struggling and suffering with this series of problems, but nobody ever checked them for anemia or any of these deficiencies. 
And so when we isolate, a lot of times when we isolate and identify these potential issues here, what ends up happening is it's not necessarily the low thyroid per se, it's the anemia being caused in one of these areas that's leading to these symptoms. And that's why the thyroid medication doesn't work. So even though these match thyroid symptoms, and if you have a diagnosis of a low thyroid and you still feel that way, even though you're being medicated or even though you're being treated, it might be because it's not the thyroid causing the problem, but it's the anemia creating the problem. So many of you probably struggle with a thyroid problem. That's arguably, I think it's usually it bounces back and forth in the top five as far as the prescription medications written in the United States. Thyroid is one of those top five consistently year after year. So I know it's a prevailing problem, but anemia is a prevailing problem too. And it's super, super common, although it's commonly dismissed um, unless, of course, you have an iron deficiency. So let's talk a little bit about what that might look like in anemia. And an iron deficiency anemia is typically going to be, on the blood work, it's going to show low iron. You might also see low ferritin. Ferritin is iron storage. It's a marker for iron storage in the liver. Um, but you also might see some things like reduced red blood cell count. You might see a reduced hemoglobin. You might see a reduced hematocrit. These are just markers that oftentimes doctors, doctors will look for in the blood. You might see a reduction in MCV, MCH, and MCHC. So these are, again, these are blood tests that are oftentimes run. It's really standard chemistry blood tests that any doctor can run. And iron deficiency oftentimes manifests with these all being low. Now, sometimes it's not just so simple as them all being low. Sometimes it's one of a few of these. So you might see an iron deficiency coupled with low red blood cell count coupled with low hematocrit. It won't be 100% matching of this scenario. And that's the trick with anemia. It doesn't always, it's not always textbook. It doesn't always show up as textbook. So if your doctors, you know, a lot of times what I'll see is the doctors will run the tests from here down and this will all be normal. So like these, we'll just draw a box around this. This is, this is part of a workup of what's called a complete blood count or CBC. It's a very common test. And a lot of times I'll get people, they have a complete blood count done and this is all normal, but their iron or their ferritin was never checked. And so, the, you know, again, they, they got a misdiagnosis. They didn't get an accurate representation of what was actually going on. And so the doctors you know, seeing this being normal, just completely dismiss iron deficiency as part of the problem. Even though iron deficiency is the most common type of anemia that presents. This is a super common problem, especially in people with a gluten sensitivity history. This is actually the most common cause gluten sensitivity is this is the most common deficiency, okay, in people with gluten sensitivity because gluten damages the part of the stomach and it damages a part of the intestine where we absorb iron and it causes iron malabsorption problems. So you could be eating plenty of foods that contain iron but not getting adequate quantities because of a inflammatory damage to the small intestine leading to malabsorption. Very, very common to see that. So if you've got a history of gluten sensitivity, or even if you don't, if you have iron deficiency anemia and your doctors keep telling you you have iron deficiency anemia and you supplement with iron and it doesn't correct the anemia and you have to get blood transfusions, like if you haven't been checked for gluten sensitivity, you should be because gluten sensitivity and celiac disease are two of the most you know common reasons why unexplainable iron deficiency anemia shows up and stays persistent. So again, if you struggle with this series of symptoms, whether you have thyroid or not, and you have a history of iron deficiency anemia and you're iron supplementing and it's not correcting, you might be gluten sensitive. On the other hand, you might already know that you're gluten sensitive and struggle with these symptoms, gone gluten free, but you're still struggling with those symptoms all because you didn't have these things checked. So it's important Again, just to get some of the right tests done. This is not rocket science here. These are basic lab tests any doctor can measure, any doctor can order to help you try to rule out whether an iron deficiency is part of the problem. Now, there are other forms of anemia. Actually, I left one off the board here. I think we got zinc 
we didn't write zinc in. So these, these nutrients below iron, so iron is the most common cause, but you can also develop similar types of anemia if you're copper deficient or zinc deficient. So zinc and copper can look, look very similar from this perspective, from a CBC perspective, these blood tests can show up looking like this with a copper or a zinc deficiency. You can also see the same kind of looking iron or anemia on a blood test when you have a protein deficiency. Protein is necessary for heme synthesis. Heme is the name of the protein. Hemoglobin is the name. Hg hemoglobin is the name of the protein that your body produces and it incorporates it into a red blood cell so that it can carry oxygen. So again, and we didn't really talk about this a minute ago, but anemia, those of you, I assume that you all know what anemia is. Anemia is basically a lack of the ability to deliver oxygen, and it can happen for two primary reasons. Now, we're talking about um, either, number one, you have a deficiency of, of, a, of a nutrient that's leading to an inability to produce the protein or the structure that allows you to attach oxygen and carry it, or number two, you have a problem in the bone marrow that's creating a reduction in your capacity to make or produce red blood cells, um, oftentimes referred to as, as uh, aplastic anemia in some cases. Um, and so again, those anemias all lead to one major problem, which is a reduction of oxygen. So reduced oxygen getting it or making it to your tissues. Remember, oxygen drives most of our biochemical processes and allows us to generate the energy that we need to function, to heal, to repair, to maintain our bodies. So we don't want to become oxygen deficit. There's plenty of oxygen in the atmosphere, right? It's just a matter of do we have a delivery system in the form of hemoglobin that is allowed to pick up that oxygen from our lungs and take it and carry it to our brain and to our other tissues. So Again, anemia is when that, there's a breakdown in that process. So copper deficiency, zinc deficiency, protein deficiency, and iron deficiency can all show abnormal low levels of these different factors on a standard complete blood count type of test. Trying to If we really need to try to differentiate iron deficiency from the rest, we run iron, we look at ferritin. Now, copper can also be measured. There's something called ceruloplasmin. Um, And it's a marker in the blood that can be measured. So this can help us to identify copper being low. You can also have, in a basic chemistry test, you can have your pro serum protein levels checked. So protein in the form of predominantly albumin is the structural protein in the, in the bloodstream. So, I mean, low levels of protein overall, protein malnourishment can create or contribute to an anemia. And again, just a general strategy is to have your doctor check these tests to help to discern whether or not this is an issue. So these are, again, some of your primary nutritional causes of anemia. Now let's talk next about, let me make some room on the board here. Let's talk a little bit, let's make room over here. So under the symptom category, let's talk about in detail kind of where your red blood cells come from and how they're produced and kind of what happens. Because if you understand this, you'll understand the nutrition component a lot better. And that ultimately is what I want you to gather from this conversation today. So if we've got you know, just generally speaking, a bone and inside your long bones, because this is where your stem cells are. Your stem cells, they're called, in short, they're called erythropoietic stem cells. They're types of cells or stem cells in your bone marrow. Specifically, their job is to help generate red blood cells. So what happens is you produce these red blood cells and when they're first born, they're, they're relatively large and they have a nucleus. So they have an internal nucleus with DNA, just like all of your other cells. But they go through this process of maturation. So they mature and as they mature, they get smaller. And then they, as they fully mature, they take on a completely different shape. And if you took biology in school, 
you may remember studying that biconcave discoid shape of red blood cells. And that is, it's, it's discoid like that and biconcave like that in part so that it can carry oxygen or O2. And inside, instead of having a nucleus, which these immature red blood cells have, it changes place. It, it takes the nucleus uh, and, and basically gets rid of the nucleus in exchange for hemoglobin. So this is, you know, again, if we're looking at this, this is a hemoglobin molecule. Its design is that it helps to attract and carry oxygen. It also carries carbon dioxide. So it basically, it takes carbon dioxide as a cellular waste product and helps you expel that when you breathe out. And then it grabs oxygen as you breathe in and grab oxygen. It binds to that oxygen and helps to distribute that to your tissue. So that's, Remember, red blood cells, this is a fully mature red blood cell, okay? The whole premise or purpose of these guys is they deliver oxygen. They're like the delivery truck for oxygen. And so either if you don't have enough red blood cells or if you don't have enough functional red blood cells that look like this, this means you don't have the capacity to carry that oxygen as effectively and get it to the different tissues so that you can drive and produce energy. So there's another stage beyond this. If you, if you don't have adequate iron, remember what we were talking about over here, if you're iron, copper, protein, or zinc deficient, and sometimes in, in the case of vitamin B6 can sometimes do this too, so vitamin B6 deficiency, you can end up with a very small red blood cell that's smaller than a, a mature red blood cell. And this is called microcytic anemia. So sometimes doctors, you know, they get fancy with the words. Um, and this is one of those examples where you have a, your red blood cells are too small and they'll call that microcytic. And, and sometimes they'll also refer to that as hypochromic meaning that the cell itself doesn't have a lot of color. Remember that when you can carry oxygen, that's kind of what helps give it that distinct color, that distinct red color. But if your cells are too pale, they're called hypochromic. So, you know, common, commonly, classically, microcytic hypochromic anemias or iron deficiency anemias. Now, um, if you're stuck up here, this is a different kind of anemia altogether. This anemia where you're stuck in the cell is too large. Where, where this comes into play is vitamin, you need vitamin B12, you need vitamin B6, you need folate, okay, to help with this maturation process. And so if you're deficient in these three B vitamins, what can end up happening is your cells never fully mature. And as they don't, as, because they're not maturing, they're too big. And this is oftentimes referred to as macrocytic. Macro means large, just like over here, micro means small. Macrocytic, cytic means cell. Macrocytic anemia is when the cell is too large and it doesn't carry oxygen very well. When it's too small, it doesn't carry oxygen. When it's too large, it doesn't carry oxygen. Now, the pattern over here might change a little bit with this type of anemia. So B12, B6, and folate deficiency anemias, instead of that MCV being low, we might see the MCV, mean corpuscular volume is what that stands for. So it's the volume within the cell itself, it's too high. So the cell has too much volume because the cell's too large, it hasn't matured. So if you ever have on a lab test, on a complete blood count, if you get an MCV that's elevated, this is oftentimes one of those markers that can be looked at and it helps us to understand whether you might have a folate B6 or B12 deficiency. Again, you know, the differences are, are very, very important because if you've been told you have anemia and you just start taking iron, you might not need the iron and it, actually too much iron and, and taking iron when you don't need it can actually hurt you because it's oxidizing. And so, but an iron deficiency or iron, iron supplementation would not correct this type of anemia. It, it would just potentially create more problems for you. So the only thing you can really do if you've got a macrocytic anemia that's B vitamin deficient is you can get more B vitamins in your diet. In essence, get those B vitamins in your diet to, to improve the ability for those red blood cells to mature to a level where they can adequately carry oxygen for you. So we've got, again, just a little bit different of a finding here in terms of, of blood work is concerned. But then you can also, there are also some tests that can be run. Obviously, You've heard me, if you've listened to me for any length of time, 
We can run lab tests. One of my favorite is a lymphocyte proliferation test to measure vitamin and mineral deficiency. And this helps us to measure whether or not these, these levels are low. Now, some doctors for, for these three B vitamins will also measure something called homocysteine, homocysteine being elevated. So an increased homocysteine can manifest as B12, B6, and folate deficiencies. Uh, and so that might be helpful. Some doctors measure instead for B12, they measure something called methylmalonic acid. Uh, some doctors measure serum folate and serum B6, although those tests are not super duper accurate. Um, it's best to, to look at lymphocyte proliferation as a tool to measure and rule out these three types of anemia or these three types of B vitamin deficiencies that can cause macrocytic anemia. Now, we've also got other nutrients that play a role in this, um, in this process. There's B5 deficiency, there's B2 deficiency. These can also be tested in the same way, but these can also cause anemias. And then we also have it, there's another category of anemias referred to as, so different than these ones, it's uh, hemolytic anemia. So I'm gonna blow up a red blood cell here. We're gonna draw a red blood cell. That red blood cell, has a membrane around it, a cellular membrane. And that cellular membrane is supposed to be strong and hardy. And so if it's not strong and hardy, it will break too easy. So what happens when a red blood cell breaks prematurely or breaks really easy? So if this cell membrane is disrupted and the cell breaks open, lice is open, this is what's referred to as a hemolytic Hemo meaning blood, lytic meaning to cut or lice. So hemolytic blood cutting anemia. So the cells break open too easy. And so that puts more pressure on the stem cells, on the bone marrow, on the erythropoietic stem cells to produce more red blood cells. And so what happens with a hemolytic anemia, a lot of times it's the membrane around the cell. It's just too weak. It's not strong enough. And this can happen as a result of antioxidant deficiency. But some of the nutrients that we know really can contribute to these hemolytic anemias vitamin C deficiency, vitamin E deficiency, and also vitamin A. I just didn't write that in. Let's just put an A right here. So vitamin E, vitamin A, vitamin C deficiency can lead to hemolytic versions of anemia. There's some suspicion that omega-3 fatty acid can also cause that type of anemia as well. So again, this is not going to manifest. This type of anemia you're not going to really have these abnormal findings here. You'll still have the same symptoms, but you won't have so much of these abnormal findings. What you might find is you might find abnormally shaped red blood cells. There's some blood tests that can be done that look at the shape, the different variant shapes of your red blood cells. And so, you know, a doctor who's looking for anemia can, can run those tests and those differentiators because sometimes what happens is because your cells are breaking down too quickly and because your, your body is demanding that you make more, these new ones that are coming out become misshapen and malformed. In essence, when, when you have really, really young cells like this, they can, be, they can have an abnormal shape to them. And so that can be detected. It, there's a name for it. It's called anacystocytosis which is just a, a way to look at red blood cells under the microscope and identify any abnormally misshapen ones, which can be a hallmark symptom of hemolytic anemia. So again, if that's going on with you, you might ask your doctor to dig deeper into omega-3, vitamin C, vitamin E, and vitamin A deficiencies and ask whether or not that's part of playing a role as part of your problem, because it's very common to see, again, antioxidant status be too low. Now, so these are your main nutritional anemias. And again, this is just a mini crash course here, but I want to talk next a little bit about what actually can cause anemia just beyond, you know, what we've just talked about. Obviously, any of these nutritional deficiencies can cause that anemia, but let's dive into what else causes anemia. I'm going to pop a slide up on the screen for you so you can you know, have a better understanding. So, okay, first and foremost, obviously, nutritional deficiency, as we've just spent a good 20 minutes talking about, nutritional deficiency is a major cause of anemia. Okay, dietary deficiency, so not getting enough calories. So calorie malnutrition 
would be kind of part of this, but it would also be micronutrient malnutrition. So what are some things that can cause nutritional deficiency aside from just not eating enough? Inflammatory damage to the intestine. So if you've got a diagnosis, again, gluten sensitivity, celiac disease, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, gastritis, esophagitis, any of the itises that go from your mouth to your anus, right? These are all potential reasons as to why you might be malabsorbing or not getting adequate nutrition. If you um, have those problems, again, inflammatory and not just intestine, but inflammatory GI tract really would be a better way to put this. That could potentially lead to poor absorption of vitamins, minerals, and other nutrients. Now, another common cause that I see women, this is when you cycle. So when you're going through your cycle and you have heavy cycles where there's a lot of blood loss, remember blood, when you lose blood, you lose a lot of iron. This is a very common cause of iron deficiency anemia is heavy bleeding or heavy blood loss during cycles. We see a lot of women develop transient iron deficiency anemia over over a heavy cycle and it can take a few weeks to, to rebuild the blood volume back up. So one of the things that you can do as a, just kind of a general tip, ladies, is if you like it, eat liver before your cycle and during your cycle to help accommodate a lot of that nutrition that you're gonna lose during that blood loss period so that you can minimize the anemia effects of a cycle. Now, heavy blood loss or trauma can also cause anemia for a lot of people. I've seen people go give their blood and a lot of times they'll check you for anemia before they'll allow you to give blood, but sometimes they miss it. Sometimes there's a person with kind of borderline uh, anemia and they'll get that blood drawn or that, that blood donation. And that again, blood loss in that way can cause anemia as can blood loss from traumatic injury or traumatic, like a surgery or something else. So, you know, these things are generally transient because if your bone marrow is working right, you're gonna reproduce new red blood cells to take the place of the ones that were lost as a result uh, as a result of, of that blood loss. So additionally, we can see, aside from known blood loss, we can see a problem with occult blood loss. This is a really common problem. And again, usually where this is takes the, where we see this is in inflammatory GI problems, but occult blood loss and, and Occult blood loss, what does that mean? That means you don't see it coming out. So like if you're taking a bowel movement and you're not going to see blood in the toilet per se, that would be like a hemorrhoid where the, you know, where the damage um, was, was in the rectum itself and you could see the bright red blood coming out in the toilet. But when the blood loss is occult, it means that the damage is either coming from further up north. So like your stomach area or your upper small intestine and the blood, by the time it comes out in the stool, it's brown. It turns brown. So the blood turns brown. You don't really see that it's there. That's why it's called occult blood loss. Okay. Because the color is not bright red. You don't really know that it's there. So one way to detect occult blood loss is to have uh, a stool sample taken and they can check it for occult bleeding. So if you have chronic iron deficiency anemia and you have for a long time, you know, rule out gluten sensitivity, certainly, but also rule out any kind of inflammatory GI problem that might be leading to occult blood loss, leading to that kind of ongoing anemia that never really fully corrects. One of the other ones that is very common is a growth spurt. See this sometimes in kiddos when they shoot up really, really quickly. So we're talking about an inch plus growth almost, you know, almost overnight. You can always tell with kids when they're about to hit a growth spurt, uh, especially in relatively thin children, because they're going to poof out. Their cheeks are going to puff out. They're going to start packing a little bit of weight on, and then they're going to shoot up. So when you see the cheeks puff out, that's a sign that there's probably going to be a growth spurt that's on the way. Those growth spurts can lead to transient anemias because their body is requisitioning nutrients to build new bone and to build new muscle. So again, we can end up deficient in some of these things during, during a quick growth spurt. So watch your kids. Your kids should never be lethargic, have brain fog, be fatigued. They should generally feel pretty energetic. And so if you start to see in a child any of those symptoms I talked about before, that's a, that's a hallmark sign to get some of these things looked at or get some of these things checked, nutritional deficiencies, et cetera, and see what needs to happen. Now, um, from a food perspective, there are a lot of things that you can do for anemia. I mentioned iron before, uh, um, or rather I mentioned liver 
a moment ago as a great source um, of, of iron nutritionally. Red meat is a great source. Bison is a great source. Any really any form of animal meat is a pretty good source of iron, although your red meats are a greater source of iron than say chicken or turkey. Um, now, if you're trying to follow a vegetarian based diet or plant based diet, you know, you got to understand that some of the iron found in plant based foods is a little bit harder to get to the plants have substances in them that bind. So for example, spinach is a good source of iron, but because of the oxalate content of spinach, the oxalate binds the iron and makes it harder to absorb. Now what some people do uh, in a vegetarian diet when they're eating that spinach, for example, is they might take in and they might add citrus with that spinach. So like lemon or orange wedges or grapefruit wedges because the ascorbate or the citric acid in the citrus actually helps free up that, that, that iron in the plant so that it's easier to absorb. We know that vitamin C improves the absorption of iron, which is one of the reasons why you see vitamin C on this list of causes because vitamin C deficiency can reduce the ability to absorb iron from plant-based sources. So if you are on a vegetarian diet and you're, you know, a lot of people that come to see me originally are on what I call a grainitarian diet. It's heavy grain, but there aren't really a lot of fruits and vegetables. It's just mostly grain shaped like cereals and breads and pastas and things of that nature. So they're really on a poor diet because it's loaded with grain, but there's really not a lot of vitamin C in it. And so there's no real opportunity for them to get good quality iron from that food because they just can't get to it. They can't absorb it. It's hard to absorb iron as well from uh, grain-based foods. So the sixth thing that we might see as a cause of, uh, of a cause of the anemia would be medication. Now, Medication, a lot of people are probably jaw dropping right now, but medications, many of them have long lasting profound impacts on your overall nutrition, causing nutritional deficiency. So for example, you know, one of the most common medications used in industrial countries is for acid reflux is a number of medications, but Nexium and Prilosec and Tagamet, um, these are just examples, your proton pump inhibitors, uh, or your histamine, your H2 blockers. These are just examples of drugs that, that reduce stomach acid. Now, when you're blocking stomach acid, you have to understand you need acid to absorb iron. And so that can cause iron deficiency anemia. You also need acid to absorb protein and copper. You need acid to absorb vitamin B12. You need acid to absorb zinc. So this is an example, just kind of one example, classic example of where a medication might induce nutritional deficiency that can lead to the symptoms of an anemia. Other medications that are a common cause of occult blood loss are your non anti-inflammatories. So if you take NSAIDs, aspirin, ibuprofen, Celebrex, um, naproxen, these medications create even at small doses, create ulcers, create erosion of the mucosal lining of the stomach, the esophagus, and the small intestine. And in so doing, they expose areas, tissue that can become damaged and start to bleed. They would contribute to ulceration. Now, if you mix non anti-inflammatories with steroids, the problem is, is, I think the last research study I read on this showed a 10 and 10 times increase, whereas if you were just using one of these alone, when you add them together, they actually synergistically work to increase your risk of developing ulceration by tenfold. And so again, that can create a, a loss of blood. Wherever that ulceration is, you're slowly bleeding out into the intestine. And by the time it shows up in your feces, it's actually occult blood loss. So if you're on medications for pain, steroids, non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, know that those medicines can damage your GI tract leading to slow loss of iron over time. That includes a baby aspirin. Many of you might be taking baby aspirin for heart disease and you know, you're thinking it's only a baby aspirin, the dose isn't that big. Well, guess what? 7.5 milligrams of aspirin, which is about one tenth of the dose of a baby aspirin is enough to cause gastric bleeding. So even enterically coded, we know this, it's been really well studied. So um, aspirin, you can add to this list of very, very common medications that people take that can contribute to the iron loss through blood loss and, uh, and contribute to the anemia. So those are your big causes. I'm going to open the field up now for 
questions that you might have. So let's dive in to our questions as they're coming in here. Okay. Um, uh, Snoopity Doopity. I love that name, Snoopity. Uh, <laughs> um, thoughts on thyroid disorders caused by Epstein Barr virus. You know, I've been in practice 20 years, and and you know, this isn't this is my experience. I, I can give you only my experience. Um, I've yet to see a case of Epstein Barr virus be the cause of thyroid dysfunction, either hypo or hyper. Um, so I don't put a lot of weight on Epstein Barr. I think um, as time goes on, I think we're going to see some of the great virology research show that viruses are actually not necessarily bad guys, not the way that we think that they are but that they actually come out and replicate when our bodies need more help. And so um, there's a lot of really compelling research showing that viruses are actually embedded in our DNA um, to the extent that they're actually helpers and not herders. And a lot of people go after and try to treat viruses aggressively for years and years and years and end up in my office. And then we find that it wasn't the virus, it wasn't the Epstein-Barr after all. So that's just my experience on it, Snoopity. Um, Hard to say that with a serious face, by the way. <laughs> um, so we got Paul. Howdy from Cali. How is it possible being the vitamin E deficient in the gamma, but not the tocopherol version of the vitamin? I don't understand your question. Are you, if you're asking if it's possible to be deficient in gamma tocopherol, but not. Uh, so gamma is a tocopherol. So again, maybe there's a misspelling there. Maybe rephrase that question, Paul, and I can answer it better. Uh, let's see here. Gina. Hi, Dr. O. I've been wanting to ask you why I'm always so nauseous after a bowel movement. I'm consistently constipated, and after a large evacuation, I'm often bloated, nauseous. It goes away after about 30 minutes. Probably during the evacuation, you created or you have something, potentially some type of inflammatory damage in your colon that gets irritated when you evacuate your bowels. Um, you might consider using some of the mucilaginous uh, herbals like marshmallow or deglycerinized licorice. Um, to coat and line your GI tract and see if that doesn't help. If that helps, you know that you might have some type of exposed tissue in your intestines that's getting irritated when you try to pass that bowel movement and it hurts for a while. I even um, That's what I would do first. Um, without getting a scope, you could also go see your GI doctor and run, have them run an upper and lower GI to see if there's anything um, untoward or, or um, detrimental going on. Where does less white blood cell count point? So, okay, so you're talking, Santino wants to know about, you know, lowered white blood cells. We talked about red blood cell anemia tonight, not white blood cell anemia, but white blood cells, you can develop white blood cell anemias. Generally, in my experience, we're working with people is that white blood cell anemias are typically also associated with nutritional deficit. Uh, B12 deficiency can also cause a white blood cell anemia, so can a folate deficiency. Um, a number of, of medications can cause it as well. And then in addition to that, you can have um, with a white blood cell anemia, a lot of times it's chronic infection where you're, you're battling this chronic infections for such a long period of time that you're having to produce more white blood cells than your bone marrow can keep up with the demand. So we see a drop overall in your white counts. Initially with acute infection, we'll see an increase in white counts, but over time with a chronic infection, we'll actually see dips and white counts. Okay, let's see here. Yeah, Juan, unfortunately, I can't give you medical advice on the show. If you're TSH, uh, if you're gaining weight on, on armor um, medication, but it's lowered, effectively lowered your TSH, then you're missing the you're missing something. There's there's probably a big chunk of what's missing. Your weight gain or your your weight itself is probably not directly being caused as a result of being low thyroid. It could be something very completely different. So, you know, work with a functional medicine expert to really dive into your nutrition would be the best thing, the best advice I could give you. I love it. Sarah watching from Tripoli at 2 a.m. Breaking the cardinal rule of sleep just to get knowledge and information. <laughs> just kidding, Sarah. Thanks for tuning in. Um, 
Gluten-free is the way to go. I agree, Jody. Dwayne says, what is the correlation between anemia and multiple sclerosis? MS, I'm assuming, is what you mean, because I feel like I don't get enough sleep every day. My T4 was tested low back in April. So if we're trying to, to correlate the connection between anemia and MS, it's generally, in my experience anyway, in people that suffer with multiple sclerosis, this is the anemia that they're generally experiencing. It's the B12 deficiency. B12 is one of its functions, as I showed you earlier, was in the replication and the maturation of red blood cells. But it's one of its other functions is in the production of the myelin sheath. And so B12 deficiency will cause demyelinization and that can lead to the symptoms of MS or it can lead to MS, the presentation of MS, multiple sclerosis, which generally manifests as neuropathy, cold and heat, uh, temperature variances, numbness and tingling in the hands or feet, weakness of the muscles, those types of symptoms set on and can become pr quite problematic. Is anemia linked to cancer? It can be. There are certain types of anemia that can be caused by, by cancers. And so um, if you suspect cancer, one of the best ways to try to get a diagnosis in that regard is to see a hematologist. There are some anemias that are caused by cancers. Um, does chronic alcohol use increase the risk of anemia? Yes, it does, Brenda, because chronic alcohol use, remember, alcohol is a gastric irritant. So what happens the more alcohol chronically that's consumed, the more risk you run of damaging the intestines and stomach, particularly the stomach and the esophagus, where you can you know, create enough damage potentially to cause blood loss, occult blood loss. Now, additionally, you know, alcohol causes vitamin B deficiency. So the B vitamin, the family of B vitamins, that's B1 through B12. The more alcohol you drink, the more deficiency uh, develops in those B vitamins. So yes, alcohol definitely can contribute to anemia. Brenda, do gastric bypass lap band surgeries also correlate with the development of anemia? Yeah, absolutely. Great point. If you've had one of these gastric bypasses, remember that that part of part of absorption. So generally, what happens in a gastric bypass is they is they kind of bypass a big chunk of your stomach and then they bring it over and reattach it to the intestine. So that's bypassing it so that you can't get a full stomach so that you don't eat so much so that you can lose some weight. But you get iron, you need that acid to absorb the iron. And so a bypass or a band is going to dramatically reduce your capacity at iron absorption. And not just iron, that's just one of the nutrients, but many of the other nutrients that need your stomach acid intrinsic factor like B12, for example, pernicious anemia and B12. We didn't talk about pernicious anemia tonight, but it is a form of anemia caused by an autoimmune process that attacks the body's intrinsic factor or ability to produce intrinsic factor. And so, yes, to answer the question, yes, the bypasses definitely can contribute to anemia. Uh, let's see. Philo wants to know, female, have finally been diagnosed with thalassemia after years of being diagnosed with anemia. What can I do to help myself with the fatigue? Yeah, that's a tough one, depending on the thalassemia that you have. But really, honestly, in my experience, Philo, the best thing that you can do is, is have full nutritional panel run. Because a lot of times with thalassemia, the red blood cells break open too easy. So we were talking earlier about vitamin C, E, and A as being kind of kind of a cause of that hemolysis or that easy to break red blood cell. And that might be the case. Thalassemia is actually an adaptation that was evolved for many people as a result as a defense mechanism for malaria, because it was harder for the malaria to, to penetrate and damage red blood cells with a misshapen red blood cell. So thalassemia, one of those genetic advantages in one way and a disadvantage in another, but, but looking for those nutrients that can create hemolysis it would be an essential um, must do to kind of combat that fatigue and, and, uh, and help you. Lizette wants to know, can anemia lead to heart problems or chest pains due to the lack of oxygen in the blood? Absolutely, it can. Remember, your heart's a muscle um, it, it, and, and it requires a lot of oxygen as well. What is the best possibly food-based bioavailable iron supplement in my expert opinion? Iron. Iron sub, I said iron, I mean, I'm going to say liver. Liver is your best food-based supplement. And I'm not talking about encapsulated freeze-dried liver. I'm talking about liver, like eat the liver. Um, don't take liver pills. You'd have to swallow like 20 of those liver pills to get any kind of nutritional semblance from what you could get by eating a serving of liver. 
Let's see. Paul, question of vitamin E testing specs is low in gamma. Would that be an issue in my anemia? Also, would a what about a red blood cell that looks a six-sided flower? Thanks again, mate. So there are different forms of vitamin E. There's not a lot of testing specs to differentiate whether or not you're deficient in one aspect of vitamin E or another, which is one of the kind of one of the reasons why it's great when you're looking at taking vitamin E to get not just um, there's, there's alpha tocopherol, which is your primary vitamin E supplement. And a lot of times it's DL alpha tocopherol, which is a synthetic version of vitamin E, typically derived from GMO soy, which I don't recommend. Uh, but it would be to take a really high quality vitamin E that has all of the tocopherol family and the tocotrienol family in them. And that way you're getting a full spectrum of the vitamin E family of compounds. I hope that answers your question, Paul. I think that's what you meant, um, but... Um, I hope that helps you. Uh, I have something called Ultra E. I don't know if you've checked it out before, but it's a full spectrum uh, of, of vitamin E, uh, tocotrienols, as well as, uh, as tocopherols. So it's a complete vitamin E supplement. Can I do a video on the best way to gain weight when dealing with Lyme and mold and viruses? Yeah, I can do that. We'll maybe make that happen in 2020. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so people with thalassemia generally shouldn't supplement with iron, but that's not 100% true 100% of the time. I mean, you can still develop iron deficiency, and so it depends, Beverly. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't supplement with iron just to supplement with iron. I think of all the supplements, you know, generally supplements are safe to take, but um, taking iron without cause or without need is probably a bad idea. Iron is very oxidative, and if you don't need it, there's no purpose in taking it. And there's actually another kind of anemia, and we didn't talk about it tonight, but it's anemia of chronic inflammation. So if a person has a chronic inflammatory disease, sometimes they develop an anemia that kind of mimics an iron deficiency anemia, but it's not an iron deficiency anemia, which is all the more reason to have full blood work done to really try to rule out whether or not you truly need iron or don't. But I, I don't recommend, iron is not one supplement I recommend taking without knowing for certain whether or not you need it. Um, let's see here. I've just been told I'm fully deficient. I don't understand. What don't you understand, Patrice? I'm not sure I understand um, your question there. Okay, keep going on comments. What kinds of supplements can I take if I have mixed connective tissue disease? This, uh, that's a question from no Noemi. I, that's a unique, unique name. I think I said it, pronounced it right, Noemi. Um, mixed connective tissue disease is autoimmune, Noemi. So it's before you just start bombarding your body with supplements, you should probably look at isolating and identifying the four cardinal triggers of autoimmune disease. There are four categories of triggers that you should ask your doctor to measure in essence to find out why you have connect mixed connective tissue disorders or disorder um, because it didn't just happen on its own. So one of those one of those causes is nutritional deficiency. So that would be a full battery of testing your nutrient levels to see whether or not you have any deficit. For example, vitamin D deficiency is highly correlated and linked to mixed connective tissue disease. Uh, additionally, You've got, um, you've got food as a rule of thumb, food reactivity can be a, a trigger for autoimmune disease, uh, chemical reactivity. So being reactive to chemicals and being exposed to different chemicals as well as microbial imbalance. So those four triggers, um, nutritional deficiencies, microbial imbalance, chemical sensitivity, and food sensitivities can all create or cause a um an issue katie shore says i jumped your question i didn't see it katie maybe um it didn't i didn't see it pop up in the feed maybe re-ask it and i can try to get to oh here we go hello from penzance uk welcome from the uk how can i help my gassy stomach if i'm on black baclofen which contains lactose get off of it <laughs> now legally i mean I, I don't want to tell you to stop medication if you've been prescribed that medication but you got to ask the deeper question, Katie, which is why you're having or why you're experiencing that, that you would require that, that medication. So my advice to you would be look at food first, because if you're having anything that's upsetting your GI tract or anything that's upsetting you here, it, you've got to look at food. You know, food is the, is the progenesis 
of many people's gastrointestinal problems. And a lot of times today, and I know this to be especially true in the UK, doctors just skip right over food, tell you how unimportant food is. And the reason why is the average medical school teaches less than seven hours of nutritional training. And the seven hours that doctors do get, you know, imagine seven hours of nutritional training where all you're really taught is how unimportant nutrition is then you would skip over nutrition with your patients too. So you just have to understand that, you know, when you go see a medical doctor who's classically traditionally trained and doesn't have postgraduate additional training, they're, they're not going to be really smart about nutrition at all. So any advice they might give you over whether or not nutrition plays a role in your illness, isn't they're not qualified to give the advice. Even though legally they're qualified, you know, scholastically, they're not qualified. And, you know, that, that, you know, you could always point blank your doctor, how many hours of nutritional training did you have that gave you the ability to give me that type of advice that nutrition plays nothing or doesn't play a role in the development of my condition? And if you ask them that question, you know, you'd probably stump them because the answer would be, I really didn't take any nutritional training. So again, um, just because they have that medical degree doesn't mean they know much about nutrition. Uh, eliminating gluten and dairy, can it help because I have a rash on my face? Yeah, I mean, eliminating gluten and dairy are like the one-two punch of, of, of a toolbox for a lot of functional medicine practitioners because those two foods combined together create a lot of havoc and a lot of problems on people's health. Uh, let's see. Paul wants to know, is low ferritin at 15 a big concern in the short term? Not really. Not really. Not unless you can match it with a bunch of these other low levels on this other side. Um, low ferritin, you know, the ferritin is not something that you push to get elevated unless iron is also deficient. Now, if iron is, and generally what happens is low iron typically always manifests with low ferritin, but low ferritin doesn't always manifest with low iron. So if it's just low ferritin, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have a, a huge like uh, daunting concern over it. So Mary Ann wants to know, when you ask your doctor to test for anemia, are you asking for intracellular testing or, or um, serum testing? So Mary Ann, it's not one or the other. What you're asking for is a comprehensive workup. And, and again, if the doctor is like, you know, shrugging their shoulders because they don't really know what you're talking about, then that's like your first sign that you're probably in the wrong doctor's office. This stuff is common knowledge. This, this right here is like, you know, if we're talking about basic 101 information, any doctor should know this information, but it's, com it's common knowledge, but it's not comprehensive. So that's where this does need to be checked, but then so do these things. And this is where lymphocyte proliferation can come in handy is when you're checking your nutritional status. And that being said, there are other nutrients that, that you can check that are not lymphocyte proliferation. So like, for example, when we check omega-3 fatty acid levels, we check that as a, as a value uh, in the blood as a percentage uh, in the cell membranes. When we check iodine, for example, there's something called an iodine loading test. So there are a number of different tests. And again, it's, it's beyond the scope of this conversation tonight to dive into the technology behind the biochemistry to be able to accurately assess all of these things together. This is why doctors go to school for eight or 10 or 12 years is to learn all these things. Unfortunately, not, again, because the average doctors don't train in nutrition, they just are missing that nutritional piece. They have this biochemical piece here, but most of them don't have that nutritional piece that they can pull from. Um, another question from Naomi, how do you, how do you know whether or not you're gluten sensitive? What kind of tests can you ask for? Um, can we put a link up for, for, for genetic testing? Genetic testing is, is Naomi is what you have to get done. If you really want to understand about gluten, whether you're reacting to gluten, because a lot of the blood tests are super inaccurate. I've done hours and hours of talks on this particular topic. If you want to go learn more about you know, about those, you can go back in our archives and watch them if you haven't already seen them. But I'll have, uh, I'll have my producer put up a link for you so that you can accurately find out what kind of test is necessary to identify gluten. Um, Donna wants to know how to stop itching all over from, from an overgrowth of candida. That's a much deeper conversation than what we can get into tonight, Donna. Why don't you go back and watch my show? I did a show on yeast overgrowth and, and start with that. Like that might be a really good place for you to start to start seeing some benefit and help. 
Let's see. Uh, Patrice wants to know if diverticulitis, I'm going to assume, is included in, in what I was talking about, inflammation in the GI tract. And yes, it is. So diverticulitis would be another condition of inflammation in the gut. Uh, let's see. Marie wants to know, if I can't get organic grass-fed liver, is it still advisable to consume or is it better not in that case? Um, I, I would be hesitant. If you can't get it organic, so like there's not like a definitive organic delineation for cattle, but uh, generally it's grass fed or it's not. Um, and, but if you know the farmer and you can get it, you can get your own, you know, some people go in together and they, and they butcher a cow together. So like, you know, four families will go in together and they'll each get a quarter of the cow and they'll buy it from a small farmer that, you know, basically just has free range grass fed cattle that aren't being, you know, pumped full of grain. Um, and that doesn't have to be organic. That liver would be perfectly safe to eat. That's what we grow on our farm. We have we have cows and and um, you know we we grow or we 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 have our cows and that's kind of the way we do it. We don't our farm is not certified organic, but there's not a pesticide that's ever been used uh, on it, and so we feel really comfortable about eating that. But if you can find you a producer, a, a meat producer who has a small farm and they're not using pesticide, then you don't have to necessarily worry about that that delineation for organic. Is the occasional use of NSAIDs damaging? Well, let's define occasional, Linda. Um, for some people, occasional means once a day, and for others, it means once a week, and for others, it means once a month, and for others, it means once every six months. If we're talking about once every six months, that would be where I would classify that occasional use. Probably not going to create an irreparable damage to your GI lining, but if you're using it once a week to combat pain, I'd say that's more along the lines of creating a problem for yourself. Sharon, if you're anemic and able to bring up your level taking supplements, how do you maintain this without supplement? You have to find out, Sharon, what caused it in the first place. So if the deficiency was caused as a result of some of the things we talked about, like medicine, now you have to ask, okay, why am I on this medicine? What can I do to improve my health where I no longer need this medicine? Like that, you know, that there are a lot of potential avenues as to why. If you, if you corrected it with with supplementation, then you can ask the question, was I not eating enough of that food in my diet? Do I have a problem with my GI tract not properly absorbing? Is there something wrong with what I'm eating that's creating intestinal damage that creates malabsorption? Am I not eating enough food? Like, so understanding that you can correct an anemia with supplementation, but ultimately you don't wanna to have to rely on the supplement for the rest of your life to keep the anemia corrected. You want your normal diet and lifestyle to be able to keep the anemia corrected. Let's see. What about estrogen's role in low ferritin? Ways to increase ferritin with iron deficiency. Um, I'm not sure I understand that question. There's not really a big role of estrogen in ferritin. So that's not, uh, not something that... Um, I'm not sure I understand your question, Christina. Maybe you could reword it. I could help you better. Um, what about antidepressants and beta blockers? Do those medications cause uh, this type of problem? Beta blockers can cause zinc deficiency. Antidepressants can cause folate deficiency. So yes, they can contribute to malnutrition. Does asparagus or Atlantic sea vegetables help fibroids and anemia? Uh, it depends, Tiffany. Um, it depends on why the fibroids are there in the first place. Um, if we're talking about sea vegetables because of their iodine richness and the fibrocystic breast tissue is being caused or contributed to by iodine deficiency, then the answer is yes. Yeah, the su well, Nancy, go back and watch the whole show tonight um, because the supplement, if you have the supplement to use if you have anemia, can be iron. But there, are, remember, there are a lot of different forms of anemia that we've talked about tonight. So. Is there a link between anemia and Hashimoto's disease? Yes, there is. Um, you can have an autoimmune process that affects your thyroid, but also affects your intestine, creating iron deficiency anemia and thyroid conditions. Let's see, what's the best way to address low stomach acid? Find out why it's low. Um, if, you, if you haven't found out why it's low, I mean, supplementally, you can take something like, we have a product called Ultra Acid for people with chronic stomach damage. Um, you can use apple cider vinegar as a, as, a, as, a, as a way to improve your digestion. It acidifies the stomach before you eat. Um, but really, ultimately, you want to know why the acid levels are low in the first place. Yeah, so what about anemia developed after IV Cipro with metronidazole? So... 
you know, that's a monster of a question because there are a lot of variables and factors that are going to go into that that I just don't have time to get into. But I mean, anytime you're IVing any kind of antibiotic, you run the risk of damaging your intestine, uh, your intestinal microbiome, and your microbiome is very critical for your ability to digest and absorb nutrients from the food that you eat. So um, it certainly could play a role in that way. Metronidazole, um, also, you know, a pretty big hitter in the, in the realm of antibiotics and antiparasitics. And so, you know, again, it, if it damages your microbiome, it can, it can set the stage for malnutrition. So you've got to follow that up with, you know, whoever prescribed those things to, you got to follow that up with them and make sure they're, you know, they're taking care of, of your microbiome. Aside from stress, what causes low stomach acid? Uh, medication. A number of medications, but low stomach acid generally, oftentimes, some some people will relate it to aging. Like as you get older, your stomach acid can um, reduce as a manner of aging, and that really isn't one hundred percent true. Really, the truth to that is, is, as you get older, you've taken on more accumulative damage over time, so you're not generating as much stomach acid as you used to. It's not really stomach acid reduction is not typically a function of aging. It's more a function of damage over time. Um, but other things that can cause low stomach acid, just aside from, uh, from years of problematic issues, one of the biggest is anything that damages your stomach. There are certain kinds of bacterial infection, H. pylori, helicobacter pylori, other types of infections in the stomach, food allergens or food sensitivities can damage the stomach, reducing the parietal cell's ability to produce stomach acid. So, you know, getting tested, you know, one of the big things you can do if you're low stomach acid producers, get tested for food sensitivity to determine whether or not food is playing a role in that. Uh, let's see, we're running out of time and the questions are not stopping. So, moose liver, is it okay? Yes, easy question. I think moose liver is just fine. Is IBS caused by inflammation? If you're referring to irritable bowel syndrome, uh, it depends. Sometimes the diagnosis is incorrect, but IBS is typically a, a mechanical disorder of the GI tract and not an inflammatory disorder of the GI tract. But again, it depends on how you were diagnosed. I see that oftentimes misdiagnosed. Um, do I have, no, I mean, Philo wants to know about the baby aspirin. Do I have advice on replacing the baby aspirin? No, I mean, get with your cardiologist. He's probably not going to agree with me, um, but, you know, we don't have a relationship where I can give you uh, any kind of major advice. So uh, it, would, it wouldn't be prudent for me to, to talk about how to help you get off medication without you going back to your doctor and having that conversation with them first. Uh, let's see, Juan, losing, um, no, not a question. Oh, thanks, Marianne. Marianne says she took my B3 a number of years ago and said it worked great for her. More energy and very impressed. Uh, yeah, you're welcome, Marianne. That was, it was um, my gift to you. So, so glad it was helpful for you. Okay. I think we can't take on any more. We've still got questions coming in. So it's time to wrap it up, folks. I hope you had a fantastic 2019. We're going to go into this new year healthier all the way around. Make sure you do me a couple different favors. Number one, you really help me out. Just like I help you out every Monday night, you really help me out when you type into the feed below. When you type in hashtag, let's just write it down so you can spell it right. Hashtag save 100 million lives. No spaces, just hashtag save 100, 100 million lives. You help me out because our goal and our mission here at Dr. Peter Osborne is to help reach 100 million lives with meaningful educational information that might have the ability to save their life. So if what I'm teaching you on these shows is helping you, make sure you pay it forward. Hashtag that so people, when they're typing in on the internet, they can find us through our messaging. So if you could type that in. Also, make sure if you haven't already, pick up a copy of No Grain, No Pain. If you have that book, it's kind of an arsenal of your go-to, what you need to know about basic nutrition so that you can prep for the show and get more out of the show every Monday night when, we, when you tune in. Number three, make sure you subscribe. Hit that subscribe button on our YouTube channel. That way we make sure that you get notified when we're going live and we do video updates, about five to seven new video updates each week for you to help you get educated and stay on top of things. And then lastly, make sure you come visit me at glutenfreesociety.org. Sign up for our 
number one, world number one gluten-free newsletter. We've got almost a quarter million total subscribers. And so I want you to come and join our email list so that we can send you and update you on the gluten-free lifestyle and keep you educated about what it takes to be truly gluten-free. So again, wishing you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. This is the last show of the year, so I will see you in 2020. Hey, don't forget to tune in next week, same time, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time for another Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain Show. Bring all your toughest health questions to me. I look forward to answering them. And before you leave today, make sure you hit subscribe. And once you do, click that bell. That bell is gonna allow us to remind you right before we go live, but it's also gonna allow us to remind you when we come out with other video content all week long. We've got lots of episodes coming your way all week long and I don't want you to miss anything. So again, subscribe, hit that bell so that you can get notified when we have that new information put up for you. Thanks so much and I'm wishing you excellent health. Have a great week. We'll see you next Monday night.